on to the Subsplash uh, and Barna webinar. We are diving into the balancing act, the three tensions facing the church this Easter. And man, we've got some awesome stuff prepared for today and we cannot wait to, to dive in. It's gonna go quick. So we're gonna get started. Uh, my name is Jessica Gale, and I'm one of the sales managers here at Subsplash. And it's such a privilege to get to serve and support those on the front lines of ministry who are faithfully serving and living out our mission every day. So from Subsplash, thank you. And I'm gonna pass it off to Joe to give a quick introduction of who he is. Yeah, I'm Joe Jensen. I'm a vice president of church engagement at Barna Group. I've been here for about three years now. Uh, before that, I was in full-time ministry, executive pastor, creative arts pastor. Uh, you know, speaking of Easter, uh, that was always a big time for for me and the the teams that I served and that I served with. And so excited to to bring some great content, and some great guests uh, along for the ride as well. All right, and up next is Nick. Hey everyone, I'm Nick Bogardis. I'm the VP of Marketing and Communication at Subsplash. Um, I spent about a decade in the marketplace and then a decade in ministry, planted two churches, and I've been in Subsplash for almost a year now. I have just absolutely loved bringing those two parts of my background together to serve local churches. So it's a pleasure to be with you guys all today. Um, Joe, would you want to introduce our panelists? Yeah, I've uh, had a chance to become good friends with both of these over the last, uh, both these people over the last couple of years. Heather Thompson Day is an author and professor uh, and a contributor at Barna too. She does quite a bit with us, uh, you know, writing and doing interviews and things like that. She's an interdenominational speaker. Um, she works in ministry. Pre she preaches on a regular basis. Uh, she's a podcast host of a Christianity Today podcast called Viral Jesus. Uh, she's a professor uh, at Andrews University. And her calling is really to stand in the gaps uh, of, church, of churches, especially for our young people. Uh, she works quite a bit as a college professor with young people. So uh, at Barna, we, we talk to her a lot about giving, you know, she gives us a lot of insights into where, you know, Gen Z and millennials are at in faith and culture. Uh, her latest book is It's Not Your Turn. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about that book in just a little bit, but uh, excited for Heather to join us. And we also have Dave Adams and David Dave Adamson is a leader in digital ministry. He has been for decades. He's just been kind of one of the go-to experts. Uh, you know, whenever I have a question about digital ministry, I usually go to Dave as one of our, our sources. Um, he was, I think, kind of one of the first online pastors. He was the online pastor at North Point Church in Georgia. Um, today, he's in Australia. He's working with a lot of ministries and nonprofits to help develop their strategies, just to help them reach and engage more people online. Uh, he also does a lot of work with Orange in Australia. And his upcoming book is called Meta Church. And I'm totally so excited. It goes perfectly with today's theme and what we're talking about. And we're going to hear more about that book in just a little bit. So, hey, thanks, Dave and Heather for joining us. And we're going to get to see them in just a little bit. All right. And Joe, you guys have prepared some awesome resources for us as well. Do you want to talk about this for a quick minute? Yeah, yeah. So uh, some of the research you're going to be hearing today, we're not going to share a ton of research today. We're just going to give you a few highlights. Uh, we did this uh, research report in partnership with Stadia uh, last year called the six questions about the future of hybrid church experience. And normally we sell this on our store for a little under $20. Uh, but for today, a special kind of for this webinar audience only, we're offering this for free. So it's a $20 report we're offering for free. If you go to barna.com slash subsplash, you're going to get tons of research and insights. So if today you're kind of wondering like, oh, I'd love to go deeper into this or that, um, this is the download for you. So go to barna.com slash subsplash and get your free download today. Oh man, such an incredible resource. Thank you guys for creating yeah. access to that. You know, many churches are going to be delighted by it. Okay. And then as well, I want to make sure you guys know about a subsplash resource we're making available too to those who attended this webinar. And this is our free ebook. So this is based on how to run a successful hybrid Easter service. And we've created it to help church teams walk through a couple questions, such as what does a hybrid service look like? Why are they important? Are they the right thing for your church? and so much more. One of the big things I'm excited about that's in this ebook is hybrid uh, service checklists. So it's giving your team a game plan uh, to make sure you can pull off a hybrid Easter service with just three weeks to go. So make sure to download that resource as well. Uh, we hope you guys are delighted by it. 
Okay, so like I said, today's gonna move quickly. We've got so much good uh, content and conversation to have. So we've got a little agenda of what to expect. First thing, we're gonna jump into the balancing act, those three tensions and really dive into those. Uh, Nick and Joe are gonna lead off that conversation. Up next is our panel interview and then our live Q&A. So be thinking about the questions as you're listening to this content, as you're engaging with us, go ahead and jot down your questions and be prepared to put them in the chat for the last part of our webinar today. All right, well, we'll get started. Okay, Joe, to kick us All off. All right. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be a Barna webinar without a few stats, right? So um, like I said, we're not gonna share a ton, but I wanted to share just a couple things to kind of frame up these, three, these tensions we're gonna be talking about, this balancing act. Uh, you know, we, in 2019, uh, we asked pastors what their top concerns for the church are. And uh, I love this visual here of this chart, because you can kind of see the, the, the wide bar starting off at the top, right? Of course, you know, as preachers and pastors, we're concerned about, you know, the gospel and, and preaching and teaching the gospel effectively. And you kind of can look, I'm not gonna read all of these, but just kind of make your way down the list and see what's at the very bottom. Uh, keeping up with the latest digital and technological trends at 7%. So we gave this huge long list uh, of major concerns for pastors to choose from. And the absolute dead last one was keeping up with the latest digital and technological trends. Now, uh, this, this tells us a lot, you know, uh, you know, there's a, first of all, there's a lot of other important priorities when it comes to like what we do as pastors. But digital technology, technological trends is, is tough for us to keep up on, maybe because there's a lot of unknowns, there's a lot of things we're trying to figure out there. So it's something that, you know, what I would like to encourage as, as a former pastor myself in the midst of all the, the shifts towards digital, like where pe people are at, you know, people are on digital platforms. We're going to kind of talk about that uh, as the webinar goes on. But I would really like to see that concern elevate. And so that's just one thing, you know, the top concerns for, for pastors. And then the other thing is, you know, uh, an, another stat I'd like to share with you is 30% of pastors say that their church is not effective when it comes to engaging congregants digitally. So we did this uh, research uh, late last year, and uh, a third of pastors say that they, they don't feel effective. They don't feel like their church is effective when it comes to engaging congregants digitally. So when you kind of put those two stats together, we see that there is a tension, there is uh, you know, things we're trying to work through as pastors to try to figure out um, how to engage people digitally uh, when maybe it's, it's some unknown territory for us. And that's what Subsplash and Barna want to do. We want to, we want to kind of equip you uh, to elevate this uh, as a priority because there's so much uh, engagement, so much impact that can be had in the digital space. And, and so those, the, that kind of is a, something Nick, I would say is, it kind of helps us set the stage of kind of, you know, where we're at right now, which is we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we manage the tension between in-person and digital in this kind of hybrid ministry uh, yeah. time we're in? Yeah. And I think, you know, when you consider the, uh, the bar graph you showed a couple of slides back, um, you have to hold it all kind of together, right? Like we, we are kind mm -hmm. of in a moment where everyone's asking, how do we do things? But you can never stop asking, why do we do things? And the why is the message, the gospel. That doesn't change, um, but we can adapt how we do ministry. Some of our ministry philosophies without abandoning core, without abandoning core convictions. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. How can we do that thoughtfully and well, particularly this Easter? But that can be a challenge, right? Um, Joe, you like this picture of a, a balancing act that, that pastors have to kind of hold in these tensions. Yeah, it's funny, as we were talking about this, Nick, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I love this, this image, because it's not only we're on a tightrope, I think as pastors, we've probably always been on a tightrope, we're always kind of feel like we're, we're balancing and managing a lot of tensions. But yeah, I love this particular image, because it's so it's like, almost like we're on another planet right now, right, when we're trying to figure out so many new things, so many new realities. So it's not only we're on a tightrope, and we're balancing things, but it's like, we're in another stratosphere, literally. And so I, I love this image here. I think it, uh, I would say, you know, I would love to in the chat, if you feel like that image represents where you're at, I'd love to just kind of like see a hand raised. Uh, Cause I know for me, uh, that's, that's been, been me in the last couple of years, just balancing that. So, um, and so that's what we're gonna talk about these tensions, this balancing act. And that leads us to tension. Number one is how do I know if what I'm actually, what I'm doing actually matters. Uh, that, you know, I'd love to know, like, you know, in the chat again, is this something you resonate with? Um, are you kind of asking yourself this question right now? How do I know 
if what I'm doing right now actually matters. And from our research, we know that a lot of pastors are, are asking these types of existential questions about their calling, about their purpose, about, you know, are they really making a difference? You probably saw from a lot of the stuff we released in the past few months, this has been a big stat, 38% of pastors have seriously considered quitting full-time ministry within the last year. And there's a lot that goes into a stat like this, right? And we don't want to speculate too much. But the bottom line is a lot of pastors are trying to figure out if what they're doing actually matters. Um, you know, when you show up every Sunday and you preach faithfully um, to a half empty room, oh, what does that mean? Is what I'm preaching actually matter? You know, the people that I'm ministering to online, when I can't really see exactly the, the life change that's happening or not happening, it, you know, it goes back to the question, am I, what I'm doing, does it actually matter? And Nick, I know we've been asking those types of questions for a long time, but now like in 2022, it seems like that question is even more relevant than ever. Yeah, um, I mean, the, the pandemic, the last couple of years have been incredibly hard uh, on church leaders. I mean, we, we have seen different numbers. I don't think anyone has done a, a, a really deep dive into the real impact on number of church closures or uh, other numbers like that, but we know that it's been significant. And so um, for those of you guys who are here who have weathered the pandemic, good job. Thank you mm -hmm. for doing that. Um, uh, and just keep hanging on because uh, it will pass. Um, if reading the Bible teaches you anything, um, there's a season for everything, right? And so uh, we, we want to try to help you move through this one into the next. Um, so that tension, Joe, you asked is an important one. And I hope you as pastors can give voice to that. Is, is what I'm doing actually, does it actually matter? Um, and we want to help and say, yes, it absolutely does. And so as we uh, look at answering that question, how can we how can we assess that question well? So a few things we want to talk about. We want to start by assessing what really matters. And that's starting with your own well-being. Um, I know in some parts of uh, church culture, there is a stigma against asking for help or talking to a counselor or um, anything like that. And um, if that's you, uh, I would encourage you to at least talk to another pastor or church leader, um, if not um, someone uh, who specializes in caring for pastors. I know for myself, I had a, a counselor, a coach for the majority of my, my 10 years in ministry because I knew how much help I did need. Like my experience was it felt like people were always putting rocks in a backpack while I was running a marathon and no one took them out. I needed help taking them out. And if that's you right now, um, there are tons of resources. Actually, Subsplash just sponsored um, a year of counseling for, um, for about 100 church leaders from a previous event we did because we really believe this is vital for the, the future of, of the resilience of church leaders right now. So um, this is you have a moment right now to evaluate how are you actually doing and how can you ask for help in that? Secondly, Joe, you want to take leaning into the team? Yeah, I was just going to piggyback on what you just said and go into this next point because, you know, it's important for us if we're, if we're leading teams or, you know, leading with teams that we model what you just said, Nick, right? Like it's evaluating our own well-being and then leading into our team to do the same where, um, you know, and I love the sub bullet point here where pastors are shouldering, you know, far too many responsibilities, especially with digital. Like, here's the thing, we can't do this on our own. So if you're in a very, very small church, right? And maybe you, you say, I don't have a team, I'm, I'm running solo. Well, you know, network with other pastors in your community, form your own team, because you just can't and shouldn't do this alone. And then if you do serve with the team, whether it's with volunteers or with staff, mm -hmm. uh, this is a great opportunity as you start to assess what really matters to lean into your team. So like bring your team together and ask them that question. Are, are we really doing what really matters right now? And how do we know? And then, and then let your team, like, the like you guys and, and ladies need to like lean into each other and support one another. Um, and then that will help you with the third bullet point, which is to listen to your people. And, and Nick, I know that as a pastor, we've, you know, uh, part of being a pastor and a shepherd is to be a good listener, right? And I know in your years of, of planning churches and leading churches, this is, this is an important principle. Um, and so I know you bring a lot to the table with this one. Yeah, it's, it's easy to get caught up in the busyness of ministry, the tasks. Um, and right now, and everything we're talking about of adapting uh, our ministries to a, a hybrid age, 100%. But if we do all of that without 
uh, listening to the very people we want to serve, uh, we're going to end up doing the wrong things. We're going to end up neglecting the most important things. Um, and at the end of the day, Jesus didn't call you to be a manager. He called you to be a pastor. And so uh, be with the people that God has called you to lead and serve and hear them. How, how are they? Um, what do they need from your church right now to grow spiritually? And we're going to talk about a few practical things to that end. But I think the principle is first, just start with listening. Ask the church what, what they need to grow spiritually in this season. Yeah, and I would say too, uh, you can do that informally, just with like one-on-one -on -one conversations and small yeah. group settings. You can okay. do that with assessments, right? So Barna, we have a ton of free assessments, and uh, and and you can go to barnaaccess.com and try to figure out, like, mm -hmm. you know, we you can get signed up for those for free. But that's the thing, whether you do it on a larger scale like an assessment or just a one-on-one -on -one coffee, it's just ask really good questions. You know, we have this very simple, almost st stupidly simple, you know, uh, principle at Barna that you can't. You can't expect to get the right answers unless you ask the right questions, right? So it starts with asking really good questions and then truly listening and having that posture to listen. And that really helps us, I think, navigate some of these tensions, right? When we kind of slow down long enough to actually listen to ourselves, listen to our teams, listen to our people. Yeah. Uh, on that note, just one practical thing, Joe, you, as you mentioned, the assessments, like uh, at our church, I would do a survey like twice a year, like just to like check in, like, uh, a bunch, you know, series of questions. You can tailor them for uh, your particular context, but that, you know, you can do individual content, uh, conversations. You can do uh, formal assessments like Barna's. You can do uh, one that you produce on like a survey monkey or something that asks questions particular to your context, but whatever it is, start with listening. Yeah. Um, now, tension number two is um, what do I do with digital now that we're back in person? Um, Thank God like that the, the pandemic in many places has gone into an endemic phase. Restrictions ha have lifted, um, especially now in, you know, in America, in blue states like the one I live in in California, restrictions have lifted. And so we can kind of start uh, going back to being in person more consistently in some of the rhythms we previously had. But we also need to consider, well, how have things changed here? And so here's some interesting data uh, from Barna. About 60% of church adults hope that churches will keep using digital means uh, of gathering together. And 52% of church adults say that primarily physical services will suit their post-pandemic lives. Now, as you look at those, that might those might seem contradictory, but they're not. They're actually complementary. Um, it's simply saying that people um, want a digital uh, option and people want to be in person. And so even for an example, my family and I, Daylight Savings, I got three little kids. We watched online that Sunday. It was a, it was a late, hectic Sunday, and it was just for our family, just better for us to be in our living room, uh, worshiping together, watching online. And last Sunday, we were in person. That is just the reality of the world that we live in now. You know, we, we, we actually interviewed Carrie Newhoff yesterday for our podcast, and he gave the example of the way that uh, our grocery shopping has changed. Our food delivery has changed. Like that, like the way that we interact with so many different aspects of our of our world has changed. And part of how we gather uh, for worship or gather as the church um, is a part of that. And we can do that in a way that's thoughtful. With again, without abandoning those first principles. Um, but this is what we're seeing out there. People want to be in person, and they want a digital option. Um, Joe, do you want to add anything to that before we move? Uh, no, I think that's good. And I would just say, you know, we, before the pandemic, I, I heard a lot of churches, including the church that I, you know, I served in, it was kind of an either or type of thing. And there was like, you know, online was yeah. kind of this optional thing, right? Even the churches that maybe were leading in that effort a little bit stronger still had a primary, like primarily an in-person philosophy. And then of course we shifted the other way with the pandemic where we only had online for several weeks and months. And, and I think, Right now, it's a, we're in a key transition moment where we have to make a decision. Do we just go back to the way things always were? Or do we move forward with a mentality to say, like, let's take the best of both? Um, because, you know, Nick, like you said, it's that that's not going away. Uh, we're only going to get more digital. And so if we put our you know heels in the ground and we just say, hey, we're, we're not, we're going to go back. I think we miss engaging so many people that, that we wouldn't be able to otherwise. Mm -hmm. That's great, Joe. Thanks. Um, well, let's talk about committing to a hybrid strategy then um, to kind of help resolve this second tension. Um, first, we want to encourage you to form a theology of technology. 
Um, this is not an option at this point. Like if you haven't considered a theology of technology or, or even like a philosophy of how to incorporate it into your ministry, you, you have to at this point. So for those of you who might be hesitant about technology, um, let me just kind of zoom out for you and, and remind you that the church has always leveraged technology to spread the gospel, right? Whether it was the Roman roads of the New Testament time, whether it was Gutenberg's press at the time of the Reformation, whether it was like sound amplification systems uh, with Billy Graham, the stadium crusades, like we have always leveraged technology. I mean, we're doing it right now with this webinar, right? Like we use technology to advance the gospel. And so there's... There is a openness, there is a, an opportunity here for you to, to consider how you can do that in your time and place uh, where God has you. But for those of you who are maybe like early adopters and technology enthusiasts, the other side of the coin I would say is this, what is your theology of it? Because sometimes um, we can be uh, more pragmatic about our use of, of technology and miss the truth that our tools shape us. Mm -hmm. The way that you implement technology in your church will end up shaping the disciples that you make. So you, you can't not do it and you can't do it thoughtlessly. And so there's an opportunity right now for forming a theology of technology for, for your church. So this is a good opportunity for you uh, to do that um before yeah and, too far along yeah nick I, I love the fact that you bring this up first right because i think sometimes we skip to the next one yeah and it's all about like okay let's yep. figure out which you know what tools we have let's figure out where we're going to spend our money here let's, you know like and we skip over this and i think the, what i love about what you just said nick is that this should inform and lead into like which tools are right and which tools yep. aren't how are we going to use those tools to disciple and so i think it's a great point you just made it's like start with like a theology of technology and then establish that. And then that can inform your strategy in the practical output of what you do. And so, you know, that leads to that second point about, you know, get the right tools in place. And, uh, and what you just said, the reality is that, you know, your tools can sh like shape your ministry. So, you know, it's, it's what, what tools we have in our hand and we have the ability mm -hmm. to actually use those tools in a purposeful way towards like discipling people um, towards Jesus. And so like that next step is get the right tools in place. And then your theology of technology should inform how you use those tools in a way that disciples people. Yeah, that's great. And this is just like, uh, yes, I'm the VP of marketing at Subsplash, but I'm also a big fan. Uh, and this is one thing I love about working here. Like we were just working with our team yesterday. Um, when, when our team builds um, features or, or products, they're doing it through the lens of, what are the activities of a disciple? Like, like someone in your church, how do they participate and how do they grow and how can we build tools to support that? Like we had a meeting yesterday about that. And um, just for what it's worth, there are some great people doing great work like that to support the in-person discipling that you are doing. And so yep. find those right tools that support discipleship in your church. And then lastly, prepare for continuous change. Um, we, uh, we interviewed Mark Sayers a little back, uh, a little while back on our podcast. And I'm pretty sure, uh, Joe, you guys have done stuff with him, uh, as well. We have um, Mark is one of the best thinkers about the future of the church. Um, and he draws on, uh, Stanley, Mc Stanley McChrystal's, uh, uh, contrast of complicated and complex, like a complicated system is one that is predictable and um, able to be organized like an engine, right? Like you can take your car, a broken car to a mechanic that can find the piece that's wrong, replace the piece, it'll run again. A complex system is like a weather pattern or like um, US elections, like you, you can't predict them. There's too many variables. Um, and so um, we have moved, he would argue, from a complicated age into a complex age. There's more interacting parts and it's hard to predict, but what you can be sure of is continual change. And here's the thing that helps you in continual change. When you have that, uh, that theology of technology, when you have your baseline core beliefs and convictions, and then you put on top of that the tools that are adaptable, depending on your context and season, um, change, change hits you less, right? Because you're, you have a firm foundation. You see what's, um, what can come and what can go. And then when change comes, it, it's really, uh, you're much more resilient and ad adaptation is, is much easier. So um, I think those first two build into this third one. The change is just going to yeah. continue, but that's okay if you have those first two bullet points in, in point. 
That's true. And, you know, Mark's there is what I, what I love about what he's, what he's telling us and, and so many other people is that we're in a really just a tremendous transitional moment in history. Yeah. And he says, yeah. if you look back at this different, like similar, like pivotal transitional moments, um, there's been great revival and renewal that's happened within the church as a result of transition. And so right now we can either shrink back in fear yep. because of all the transitional elements, or we can lean in as church leaders to say like, how can this be the moment of renewal and revival for, for a new generation when it comes to discipleship? And, and so that, in, and so when it comes to digital, it's like we can either shrink back or we can lean in. Uh, because our, the, you know, 63% of church adults believe churches should use digital resources for purposes of spiritual formation and discipleship. So this isn't just screens for the purpose of entertainment. This is screens for the purpose of discipleship. And the question is, how can we leverage this to make resilient disciples of Jesus um, that can lead towards like renewal and revival that hasn't happened for decades? And so I love that you bring up Mark Sayers because he's, he's reminding us of that really important point. People are hungry for this. People are wanting this. Yeah. Um, the question is, are, how are we going to respond? Uh, real quick, I just want to say like a lot of this stuff, these six questions that are in this hybrid church experience um, report that we're offering for free uh, helps you work through some of these things. So you can take those six questions and actually work through those six questions as a team. All the other side of those six questions is, is, is some of these principles here. So I'd encourage you to pick that up. Mm -hmm. And that leads to our third tension. We got to crank through this last one real quick so we can leave room for our interview, Nick. But um, this yeah. third tension is where do we go beyond Easter to maintain momentum? Okay. So there's so much, and I know, you know, Nick, you and I, like for years, we've like Easter's always been like the big show, you know, and I use that, that term, you know, purposely yeah. because that's kind of what it's been. Mm -hmm. um, but I think like people are hungering for so much more when it comes to Easter and then a show. Yes. They're wanting something deep or something more. And so like we, we want to lead into Easter, giving people what they really need, not what they want, which is a deep encounter with the living God through the mm -hmm. resurrection story. Mm -hmm. But then that's only the beginning, right? Because Easter is just one day of the year. So how, like, where do we go to create momentum beyond Easter? And so we want to end, you know, our third tension by asking ourselves that question. Yeah. I, I want to repeat something that Carrie Newhoff said yesterday. That was brilliant. Uh, for this first bullet point, uh, he said the culture's not looking for an echo; they're looking for something other. Mm -hmm. And you have an opportunity every single interaction that you have with people in your church, whether it's on one-on-one -on -one counseling or leading a small group or preaching on a Sunday, to remind them that there are things that are supremely and eternally important and significant and good. That's one of the things I miss the most about pastoring is like every single Sunday, you get to kind of stand in between these two domains of heaven and earth. And you get to remind people that Satan and death and sin and the law have all been defeated. And Jesus has come to give them new life and forgiveness and mercy and grace and all the incredible things that the gospel brings. And starting with yourself and reminding yourself that what you do, the size of your church, how good of a preacher you are, whatever you're measuring yourself in doesn't define you. But the fact that God loves you, knows you, has called you, has placed you here is the very thing that matters the most about you. And then bringing that goodness from the overflow of uh, your own experience with Jesus and the gospel to remind your people that the good news is still good. So I would say start there. Secondly, um, take a risk and try something new. You know what's fun? Like, I feel really willing to take a risk um, when I feel really secure. And if you're loved by God and known by God and he's with you and like your church is going to grow because of him and not because of you, um, you can risk, right? Like you can take some really calculated risks. And so um, test something new, um, iterate and learn. Like I mean, you're, you're going to hear from Heather in a minute. Um, and I, I would imagine she might say something like gather some of the young people in your church and ask them what risk they think you might might make sense for your church to take this Easter to reach more people, to uh, to grow more people uh, in their uh, in their faith in Jesus. That could be a good opportunity. Corral some of those folks and even and ask, listen, right? Joe, what would you say about the third one? Well, it goes back to like some of the core principles you just shared, right? Stay focused on saving the lost, not simply filling empty seats. And it goes back to some of these other tensions, right? Like what matters most? You know, that first tension of like, Am I, what am I doing? Does it really matter? 
Um, and, and really let's focus on the things that matter most, which at the end of the day, there's still a lot of lost people out there that need Jesus, that need the gospel. And uh, it's easy for us based on an old metric of success to look at empty seats and to gauge how Easter is going or, or how, how well it's going or not based on how many seats are full. And again, this is a, a, something, especially now, I think the pandemic, God has used the pandemic to break some things down, idols that we have set up as church leaders. One of them is, is the seat, right? Are the seats in our, in our churches. Like that's been yeah. an idol for so long. Yeah. So really it's like, stay focused on saving lost people. It's, I know it's very simple. It might yeah. seem obvious, but it's not so obvious totally. when it, when it comes to like breaking down those idols, we need to stay focused on saving the lost, not simply yeah. filling empty seats. Yeah. There was a, there was a quote I used to read every Easter in the morning before service, Joe, by a guy named Zach Eswine. And he, you know, he was reflecting on his really rough upbringing. And he asked the question, he said that the question preachers need to ask is, could I now reach who I once was? Yeah. And that question to me was always just brought the personal need and mission uh, to the forefront for me. And so uh, for you guys this Easter, maybe that's a good question that would motivate you. Like, could you now reach who you once were, those people in the pews who may be where you were you know, a few years ago or a decade ago, whatever it was, can you reach them with the good news? And that's a great call yeah. for this, this Easter. And that's the good fight, right? Yeah. Like that's yep. what, like first Timothy six twelve. it's like fight the good fight for the true faith. Like what's true and, and hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which yeah. you have declared so well before many witnesses. Like yeah. that's written from Paul to Timothy, maybe one of the first senior pastors in the new Testament. Right. And I think it's a message that's so relevant for us today. Like, like let's define what that good fight is. Let's define what matters most. Let's commit to that. Uh, it's not about empty seats. It's about empty hearts that we're trying to fill with the gospel. And, and so it's a good reminder. Yeah. Cool. Thanks Joe. Yeah. Anything else on the scripture? I, I know it's so profound. <laughs> No, I think we're good. Great. Awesome. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much. Um, one other resource just to call out, Nick, I'll let you talk about this. I know your teams work really hard to develop it. Yeah, this is, um, again, just a really practical resource for you as you are looking forward to Easter, um, answering questions like, what is a hybrid service? Why are they important? Um, and even a checklist for conducting one, you know, at Subsplash, we, we believe that the truth of Jesus, the life of the local church is the greatest source of hope and joy for humanity. And so this is one of the ways that we try to help you take that hope and joy to the world. So you can go to subsplash.com slash Easter ebook uh, to download yours today. Thanks. Yeah. And then, yeah, just some closing thoughts on this. I know this is such an incredible kind of quote and thought, Nick, um, that you've yeah. really been needing here. Yeah, I think we've I think we've hit this pretty well uh, through the webinar here. Mm -hmm. um, hang on to that message. Hang mm -hmm. on to the the central truths of the gospel, the good news that you bring in this Easter, and be open to listening and trying mm -hmm. new methods in this moment um, to grow people in their discipleship and to reach more mm -hmm. people with the good news. Mm, man, well, thank you, Nick and Joe, for just sharing some incredible research. Joe, thank you for your team at Barna, who is just on the front lines of that research. And Nick, as well, for your insights and thoughts. I don't know about anyone else, but I am so encouraged and just uh, fired up on, man, this is why we do what we do, is making the truth of Jesus incredibly accessible. So um, that said, we're going to transition into our panel time. We're so thrilled. Uh, Joe, I, I know that you have some great connections with um, both Heather and Dave. I think he may be stepped back. So um, I will actually jump in here again. Heather and Dave, thank you so much for being here. Hi, Heather. I can see you. Hello. Hello. Dave, thank you for being here. I know it's an early morning for you. <laughs> I'm so glad I get to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man, we're thrilled. Okay, well, we're going to jump into our panel interview here. So thanks, guys. We'll start with some questions. Okay, so the first question, uh, we have this for both Dave and Heather. Uh, what is the most common objective you hear or uh, objection that you hear from pastors when they're hesitant about digital discipleship? I can go. I think that one of the things I hear the most is that it doesn't, 
it, it's not going to be as effective. And so I want to spend my time doing what I think is most effective. And what I would say to that is in kind of what they talked about already, that it's not this either, or it's this both. And, mm. and one of, I'm a communication professor, so I love communication, but there's this a very important sociological paper called the strength of weak ties. And essentially what it says is we will spend all of our time thinking that the only things that make our life um, fulfilled or happy is that we have these really intimate circle of people that we have day-to-day -day relationship with and who understand me. And the strength of weak ties found that actually just as important to those day-to-day -day people who we have really intense relationships with are the weak ties, are the casual relationships that we keep, like they actually make us happier than just our face-to-face -face important, intimate relationships. So there's so much value in digital discipleship. Mm, so good. And Dave, your thoughts on this? Yeah. You know, look, I've been in digital ministry since like 2008, um, back when we were just getting out of the dial-up phase. And you, the, the, the thing that I hear most and, and still hear it today is, you know, the verse that talks about uh, us uh, not giving up meeting together, that mm -hmm. whole idea is probably the one that I hear um, most commonly, uh, Hebrews 10, 25, mm -hmm. and, and which is great. And I, I totally get that. But I, I keep going back to in the first century when that was written, mm -hmm. there was one way to gather together. And that was physically, if you can't gather together physically, then you didn't gather. But in the world that we live in, you know, there's so many different ways for us to gather. I'm in Australia right now at 4.40 a.m. gathering with all of you guys. And I feel as connected as if I was sitting in the room with you all, um, even just following along with the chat that we're definitely together with, with the people who are watching this webinar. Mm -hmm. So I think that the world has shifted dramatically around that idea of what it means to gather together. And, and often when I have these conversations with pastors, the, the thing that I keep talking about is, you know, Malachi talks about bringing the full tithe into the storehouse. Yet as church leaders, we don't only accept giving when it shows up in cash in person, right? We, we changed our theology around the, the giving portion of it. I think it's time for us to change the, the definition of what it means to gather together as, as a whole holistic organization as the Capital C Church. Mm, yeah, thanks for sharing those thoughts. That sounds like a perfect uh, conversation for that, that theology of technology, right, Dave? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I actually have a, a question for you. Um, what practical tips, Dave? I mean, you just mentioned dial-up, and I immediately yeah. heard that tone in my in my head, like from 2008 of trying to connect to AOL or whatever. Um, but you've been doing this for a long time. So yeah. what practical tips would you give to pastors when it comes to intentionally engaging people online this Easter? Yeah, such a good question. And, and um, I, I think for me, my philosophy has changed over the years, right? In 2008, the church that I... I was working at in in New Jersey, you know, I, I would run these online stream services and, and the big win out of the service was how many countries were watching, you know, we, oh, mm -hmm. you know, I would do reports about we had 70 different countries watching we had five people watching from Iraq, you know, they were the big wins for us. And then when I moved to North Point in Atlanta and having conversations with Andy Stanley about online ministry, and he kept talking to me about the fact that while God had given him a worldwide platform as a communicator, God had called him into a local context as a pastor. And so for him, his win was reaching people in Atlanta. And, and as an Aussie on staff, I was like, come on, we've got to reach Australia. We've got to reach New Zealand as well. Can't we just, and he would say, no, God's called me. Yeah, to, to reach the people of Atlanta. And so that's when my philosophy, my theology as well started to shift when it came to online. I think too often what we do is we think we're online. So we've got this worldwide audience. So mm -hmm. when it comes to intentionally engaging people, I think the best thing we can do as pastors is create content that meets the needs of the people in the community to which God has called us to serve. You know, we get told so many times in this world of social media, the world of online communication, that content is king. After all the years that I've been in online ministry, what I've learned is that context is king. Mm -hmm. The context that we speak to, the context that we uh, broadcast to when we're doing live streams or doing online classes, that's the most important thing. In fact, 
I'm going to take that back because we think of the internet as a broadcast medium, but it's actually a narrow cast medium because we get the opportunity to connect one on one with people and answer questions in chats that you don't get to do when you're listening to radio or, or watching TV, right? So mm -hmm. it's a narrow cast ministry, uh, I'm sorry, narrow cast medium. So when it comes to being intentional about uh, engaging with people online, I would say the first thing you need to do is engage with those families who live within a 30 minute drive of your building wherever that is, that's probably the best thing you can do because context is king. That's great, Dave. Um, even practically something um, I, I've heard uh, other churches do uh, to kind of work that context really particularly uh, might be to have an in-person gathering of some kind within that region, whatever your context is, you know, right after Easter and, yeah. you know, use those who are engaging with you online for that Easter service and connect them to that in-person event right afterward. You know, mm -hmm. um, when we were leading, uh, when I was leading a church, uh, we always joked that the connect card was like the promise ring. Like for someone to actually fill one of those out, it actually was some, it was like a really significant um, commitment for them. But you know what, going to a barbecue or going to a lunch or going to something else afterward is a much lower bar of commitment. And so if you can help them engage on Easter, then then help them connect in person to something a little lower commitment, that could be a really practical step to take. Mm -hmm. Have you heard anything like that? Uh, other people do things like that, Dave? Um, yeah, yeah, and, and they're the, yes, I have heard that, and, and that happens a lot, especially in, in my context here in Australia. I see local churches doing that sort of thing as well, which is super important, right? Because then it's making that extra step of engagement. Sometimes we think that engagement only happens online, but it happens in person as well. And if our context is our priority, you know, that community that God's called us to serve to, if that's our priority, then these sorts of events should be happening more regularly. Thanks, Dave. And now we have a question for Heather. Yeah. Um, what should pastors be thinking about the day after Easter and what should they pay attention to for the rest of 2022? Yeah, I think we should be paying attention to our people. I think a lot of times the temptation, especially when it comes to online communication is we see numbers or, you know, we're, we're just looking at followers and where if you're a communication person, you never think before you give a speech, if you were to ask a most speakers, what are you thinking about before you get on stage? They would say, I'm thinking about my message. Communication people will say, I'm thinking about the person and how do I connect to this person? And if need be, how do I even a great communicator thinks, how do I change my message to fit into this person's life so that they can receive it? Cause a message that's not received is never actually communicated. Yeah. Right. So I think the thing that we need to be thinking about is how are we actually connecting to our people? And a mistake that I think we can make is only, only focusing on our own content and only focusing on what we post. My goodness, I don't like to follow people that don't ever interact with me. Mm -hmm. The reason I want to connect with somebody is because they noticed me. I think churches need to spend more time, not just thinking about what you're posting, but mm -hmm. who am I following and how am I responding to the things that they posted? How am I showing them that I care about who they are and want to connect into their real lives? Mm -hmm. So I just think we all need to be thinking about how do we show people that we notice them? Mm. That's how we actually connect to them. Mm. Yeah, Heather, that's that's so good. Um, that whole thing of, I mean, we're, we're sometimes we're we're more focused on the content where we've produced in the form of a message or something than the people that that we're producing it for. And I think that's especially important principle for like engaging younger generations, right? Like especially in the digital space. So, you know, that kind of leads to another question for you, Heather, and, and, you know, Dave, feel free to comment on this as well. But when it comes to digital discipleship, what do young, younger generations want and what do they need from the church? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go out on a, on a limb and say that part of what they need and what they want, Heather, is exactly what you just said. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about younger generations specifically and, you know, your work, you know, leading college students, and I would even say discipling college students and what you do as a professor, just hearing kind of your approach to education. What, what are some uh, tips and, and piece of advice that you have for church leaders when it comes to younger generations specifically? Do you know what I really think? I think they want to be trained. 
Mm-hmm. I think that they want to be a part of the body of believers. We, we go through all of our lives today in this participatory experience. I don't just watch a television show. I get mm-hmm. to live tweet my thoughts and people respond and engage with me. Mm-hmm. And then they come to church and we want them to sit down, be quiet and listen. Mm-hmm. And I think they need training because like there's a priesthood of all believers and how are we getting them involved in the ministry of the gospel? I promise you, if young people feel included and like they're participating in the gospel and being trained by you, they're not going anywhere. They will stay and they will come back for more because there is such a hunger. This is from Barna research. There is such a hunger for mentorship in this generation. And we know in corporate culture, how do I get my workers to stay? I mentor them. People who stay are like 33% more likely to stay at the organization. If they have a mentor, what are we doing in our churches to make sure that we're mentoring our young people to realize that the gospel isn't just something that they hear. It's something that they're supposed to share. And what are the ways that they're able to do that? My goodness, every single person has a cell phone in their hand. Mm -hmm. You said it earlier, Joe, what's in your hand Mm -hmm. and how do we train them to use it effectively? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. I agree with Heather. And especially Heather, what you said uh, in the last question, I think is super important, right about following. I think what a lot of young, uh, you know, young people want, and, and I've got teenage daughters. And so I, I, I hear this from them all the time, right, mm-hmm. is that um, they want they want the church, they want their church community, their leaders to connect with them. And as a parent, I definitely want my church, you know, the adults at my church to be connecting with my daughters and mentoring them and coaching them. Um, You look at the statistics over the last couple of years, whether it's Australia, whether it's Europe, or whether it's the US, the the, um, percentage of people who feel lonely in the world has just gone up exponentially during the the lockdown period. And so now's a great time for us as church leaders to, to, to step out and really just start connecting and engaging, having those conversations with people. I know right here in Australia, for example, during the 2020 period, uh, there was a research company here that did a big study and they showed that 33% of Aussies are more likely to have a spiritual conversation now than ever before. And that's the first time in my lifetime that I can remember so many people who live in the community around me, just in the houses that are around me, who are open to having spiritual conversations. And I think part of that is because they're lonely. I think Mm -hmm. part of that is because they realize there's got to be something more to what I was doing. And that, that connection that people have when they get followed to Heather's point earlier, um, when they get followed by somebody else, when they uh, hear people that are listening to, they know people are listening to them rather than just talking at them. I think that's a huge thing. And especially amongst, again, my, t- my teenage girl's age, that's what they want more than anything because they've grown up in this world where I, I think at the moment they feel like they've got like 10,000 followers, but they've got no friends or they've got <laughs> nobody who's really listening to them. And that's, we, we've got the opportunity to make a big difference in that area if we understand the questions that they are asking. And this is the thing, it's a shift for us as church leaders though, right? Because we think people go online to search for a local church, but the reality is they go online to search for answers. So what are those questions that are being asked? What are the answers that they need? And how can we as church leaders understand what they are within the context within which God has placed us and leverage online tools like social media, like webinars, like uh, live stream services to start meeting some of those needs. Oh, man, Dang, I feel, I feel like I'm at church right now, right? <laughs> Dave, <laughs> Dave and Heather are taking us to church. That's good. Oh, man, this is so good. I think we may need a follow-up podcast episode, maybe a subslash one and a Barno one. Uh, yeah, I know I'm writing down notes myself. Uh, one other question I wanted to jump to, if that's okay. I know we're getting a little closer on time. We want to leave some time for Q&A. Is, is this one right here for, for Heather? So Joe, if you want to ask it, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, like what I what I love, Heather. I've heard you talk about this book before. Um, you know, it's not your turn. I think it's actually actually directly related to your response about the next generation. Yeah, tell us a little bit about this title because it's so intriguing, and why it's relevant. You know, this it's not your turn uh, concept. And and yeah, tell us a little bit about that book. Yeah, I'm gonna I'll make this as brief as possible. Essentially, what I've come to, and this is what the entire book is about: mm-hmm. who you are when it's not your turn is more important than who you will be when it is Mm. (laughs) who we are, whether or not, I mean, and this is what I say to people are you like, it does not take integrity friend to preach a sermon to 2000 people. Are you kidding me? That doesn't take character in it. Doesn't take an anointing. Anybody would do it. We love to speak when people clap for us, it takes integrity and it takes character and it takes anointing to show up for five people. Mm. 
Mm. That is the heart of Christ. It's actually going to make me cry because I just believe it so deeply. And I really think we have to raise a generation of people who will do the work when it's not their turn, when nobody cares, when nobody's watching the choices that we make in those moments, that is actually who we are. Mm. And so how do we start showing up? It's always your turn to show up to your life. Mm. Heather, yeah. I always get goosebumps every time you say that, right? Because it's, it's at the, you get that, oh, that whole principle, it gets to the heart of why we do what we do as pastors, or at least it should, right? It, it brings us down to the basic core essence of what we've been called to do. So Heather, that passion in this book is just so good and so timely. Dave, were you going to jump in and, and comment? Oh, I was just going to ask Heather, where do I get a copy of this book? Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Anywhere books are sold. Thank you. Anywhere books are sold, right? That's the, that's the spiel. And that's a good transition, Dave, because you're, I mean, you've been laboring away for like the last year, writing a new book that's getting released, what, in a, in a month or two? Tell us a little uh, bit about yeah, Meta Church. Yeah, it goes on pre-sale tomorrow, I believe, on, on Amazon. Um, yeah, so so I wrote this book called Meta Church, and really the idea behind it is, you know, what everybody calls hybrid church, um, you know, it goes by different names. I know at North Point in 2017, I started having chats um, with the leadership there about Omni Church, which was my word for, for sorry, Omni Channel Church, which was my word for hybrid church. And then as I started to process a couple of things, what, what I wanted to do was understanding that there's a lot of uh, data out there that suggests that the era of the mega church is on the way out, like the number of mega churches is declining, the number of people attending mega churches is declining. So I wondered what was next. And so what I realized is that word meta is just a prefix that means two things. It means to transform as in metamorphosis, or it means to go beyond as in metaphysical. And I think in the world we live in, the church needs to find ways to transform its model and go beyond just the Sunday, go beyond just the church building. Um, so I came up with this idea of meta church. This was probably three months before Facebook changed its name to meta. Um, and so I'm not talking about a church in the metaverse. I'm talking about a church church that's willing to go beyond uh, just its Sunday services, beyond just its church mm -hmm. building, because I, I think if the discipleship capacity of a church um, is, is limited by the seating capacity of a building, then we're missing a real opportunity to make a difference in the world. So my, my, my theory is that a mega church is essentially um, one expression of church with a really large community, while a meta church is multiple expressions of church, whether that's podcast, online, in person, house church, virtual reality, um, YouTube, whatever it might be, but with one mission. So the model changes and goes beyond so that the mission stays the same. Mm, that's so good, Dave. We are excited for both of these books. I'm like jotting them down myself. I can't wait to read them. Um, but that concludes our, our panel section of today, which man, Heather, Dave, thank you guys so much. Seriously, I, Nick, can we arrange, can we get both of them for follow-ups on our <laughs> podcast? I'm putting that request in. Um, a few quick reminders before we jump into our Q&A. Uh, you have the hybrid church report so graciously provided by Barna. So make sure to download that. Olivia's on it. She's putting the access um, link right there in our chat. So make sure to download that, take advantage of that incredible resource. And then just some quick reminders with Subsplash as well. Uh, we have our Easter sale going on right now. For those who are not currently partnering with us, they're not currently on the Subsplash platform, there's up to $750 worth of savings in getting started with Subsplash right now to help partner with your technology and even more importantly, partner with you long-term strategically as you think about scaling and growth and just discipling who's in your sphere right now. For those currently on our platform partnering with Subsplash, uh, there's also some great savings for you. So there are upgrade opportunities that would provide up to $299 in savings. And of course, our incredible ebook. Man, go download that. I love the checklist that's in there, but as well, so many other great thoughts as you think through hybrid services and Easter coming up. So as we transition into Q&A, We've got space and time to ask some questions and you guys have been throwing in some awesome questions in the chat. So we're going to be able to ask some questions to Joe, Nick, Heather, and Dave. So let's see what we've got going so far. Okay, it looks like our top question. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is from Max. How do we discourage the culture of pajama worship that live streaming has caused, which it keeps people away from the church? For live worship. Anyone want to take that one? 
Yeah, I can say something to that. Uh, at least what I say to my students all the time, because mm. their argument when they say they don't want to go to physical church is I can listen to the best speaker at home in my underpants, in my pajamas, and I'm fine, Dr. Day. I don't need anything else. And what I say to them is this may be true, but what you can't do at home in your underpants or in your pajamas is have a relationship. And the reality is what we need as a church, what we will do as we thrive is experience relationships. And so is as churches and organizations, we can provide a relationship for our people. They'll come. Mm. Mm, that's so good, Heather. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. One of the things that I would also suggest, uh, well, there's probably two parts. This first one is, you know, we, we need to be creating content during the week um, mm. as a church, like whether that's a course mm. or, or parenting content, for example, like how resourcing parents, how to disciple their kids uh, from home, uh, those sorts of things. If we can focus on those midweek things, then mm. it takes that emphasis off the Sunday. And mm. then one of the other things I would suggest is, Maybe, maybe, well, maybe the most innovative thing, thing some churches could do is to not stream on mm -hmm. their Sunday services. That mm -hmm. might be the most innovative thing that your church can do. And that will actually create an opportunity for people to come back because they're missing out on that shoulder to shoulder singing worship thing. Um, mm -hmm. and, the, and one extra piece, maybe, maybe controversial. Mm -hmm. I, I think that churches should stop streaming the musical worship portion of their church online. Mm -hmm. Um, that creates a sense of FOMO for one thing. Like that's the thing I'm missing out on. I want to, I want to worship with everybody come to our building. But mm -hmm. also when you look at, you know, you, I, I look at Disney plus, they spent $12 million putting Hamilton together, right? They had professional singers do mm -hmm. that performance three times in order to get one live stream version of it that they edited together. Yet mm -hmm. most churches have volunteers come in who run through the songs first time on a Sunday, and then we stream that out and we wonder why it doesn't sound as great. So I, I think if we took some of that pressure off and created opportunities for people to come and experience that one thing, I think from a church service that you really have to be in the room for, mm. I, I think that's another way that we could encourage that. Yeah, yeah Dave, you're touch. Oh, sorry. I think Nick was going to jump in. Go for it, Nick. Yeah, I think I can kind of hear Max's question. Um, uh, you know, a, a frustration, um, but I think related to uh, what Heather was saying, it's probably just good to reiterate and, and train your church in what is the church. And if you can frame it less in a um, rigid, legalistic um, kind of like, well, it's not actually the church if you're not here, so just get here way mm -hmm. and more like Heather did, which is God's intent is that mm -hmm. we would gather as a people who, who know and are known by mm -hmm. him and by one another. Like if you can frame it in a way that is biblically true, but also compelling um, and train people in what churches, I think that's really helpful. Um, I think a second thing, I, I also love what Heather said about raising the bar and training people. Um, I, I, I also have seen firsthand that people respond to that. Like they, they want to grow and be trained. Practically, you could put those kind of things actually on Sundays, um, because uh, I've seen people are super busy during the week. And I, I think Dave, you're right, like midweek programming can be 100% helpful. But I found one of the safest blocks of time actually was immediately following a Sunday service because they're already there. And so if you were putting important things um, following um, Sunday, that could be something you practically do. And then thirdly, framing, I think uh, Matt Chandler has done a great job on his podcast. If you ever listen to his podcast, he all like, there's a little script that he says before every sermon. It's like, this is just meant to supplement your engagement in a local church, which cuts against what Heather said that she hears from her students about wanting to just listen to the best preaching ever, which frames what they're about to hear as something that isn't primary, but supplemental. So if you can even do that on your, on your um, live streams, that could be a third practical thing that you can do. And I just throw in one quick thing, because I know everything that's been said is pretty much enough. But I will just say one thing I want to challenge us to make sure we're not perpetuating an idea of church inadvertently by how we communicate what it means to be on mission and community. Okay, so we have to be careful not to inadvertently kind of communicate this idea that church is about coming to one hour a week. Mm. And so, hey, pajama worship. Uh, I get the, the spirit of the question, and, and I, I believe that commun relational in-person community is invaluable. It's irreplaceable, mm -hmm. but we have to remember that that can happen in so many different places. In fact, it should happen in so many different places mm -hmm. outside of the four walls of the church. Okay, mm -hmm. so yes, we need to gather. We need to worship together. We need to hear God's word together in person as much as possible, mm -hmm. but we also have to be careful not to inadvertently communicate this idea that church is a, like the ultimate expression of church 
is about one hour a week. So I would just encourage you to make sure you pick your words very, very mm -hmm. wisely and very carefully to, to say the important things that you're on mission for Jesus and the gospel, wherever you go, mm -hmm. that pajama worship is, is, is not, is not a good thing. If it like perpetuates this idea that I, church is all about consuming and it's all about me, mm -hmm. but pajama worship is actually a good thing. If you're wearing pajamas and you're, you're going out and you're, you're being Jesus in the flesh in all these different areas of life, community, you know, in community, in all these different aspects of life, not just one hour on Sunday. Yeah. And I'll just jump in and say, this is something our ministry consultants are having conversations daily with those on the front lines of ministry about how do we do technology? Well, how does technology actually aid for in-person connection? And then when that's not an option, right? When schedules don't allow, how do we use technology to connect from afar and connect mostly with the gospel and then with the community of believers that God has called you to. So, um, man, everyone is saying such great, great insights and great thoughts. I know that technically we are at time. So I'm going to look at Q. I think we need to wrap it up unless Chris, uh, tells me something different. I know there's some other good questions and we can reach out to those who have unanswered questions and, and get those answered for you guys. But Thank you to Nick, Joe, everyone. Um, actually, I'm getting the cue that we can do one or two more. So we're going to do that if you guys are okay with it. All right, cool. Um, so one great question that's gotten vo voted up is, what are some examples of churches that get it and how they got it? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Thank you for that question. Hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> We're all cycling. I, I, I can add something here. And I know that this probably won't be a popular answer, but I've actually seen a lot of really good work that they do. in as far as their zoom small groups, um, with elevation worship. So online they have, they provide all these zoom small groups that as the service is going, you're kind of watching with a group. And then there's questions going on in the chat as you're watching, which I just think is a great way to do at least the worship portion for people online so that they feel like they're participating in the sermon and applying it to their lives. Mm, yeah, that's good. Yeah. I think maybe even thinking through like, okay, how do you get it? What are some things to think through um, when you're trying to go, okay, technology's here. How do I use it as a healthy, good tool that breathes discipleship? Um, that may be a good way to break it down too, if anything comes to mind there. I think for me, the church that stands out um, is Mark Batterson's church in, in oh. DC. Um, during, the, during the lockdowns, what they did was they turned a lot of their stuff obviously online, but they didn't just stream their services, which, which they were already doing. They started putting out midweek podcasts that were short Bible snippets that were you know, only eight minutes long or something. They started a Tuesday morning at like 7.14 a.m., some weird time, this prayer group that would last for, you know, only a few minutes, like five or 10 minutes or so, um, so that the church could gather together and pray. They called it the Upper Zoom, which, you know, full credit to the name. Um, they also started creating uh, kids content like they would, they, they did, a, I think it was a live stream that, that one of the church pastors would read by Instagram, like a story time for kids when the kids were going to bed, like that sort of stuff uh, was super significant. I know to them as a church, but it all, you know, where it came out to, you know, that question that was asked about, you know, how did they get to that? They just decided what's the best way for us to continue to gather as a local church and reach the local community of DC? How can we serve the families of DC? Oh. So that was their catalyst for it. The context was the catalyst for the content. What they realized, I think what they realized, and I, I didn't ask him this, but I think what they realized is, you know, that content can make a post, but context can make a difference. And so when they started to apply that, that's when they started to go, what's the best thing for us to do for the local people of Washington, mm -hmm. DC, and how can we serve them best using online tools? Mm. Yeah, and I would add, um, you know, Church of the City in, in New York, John Tyson's church, uh, they did some great digital prayer gatherings. I actually just kind of sat in on one on Sunday, even though I don't live in New York and I don't go to that church. I was just curious and it was really meaningful. And uh, there was like actually some deep prayer moments that I experienced personally in that. And then in, on the other side of the country in Portland, Bridgetown Church, which is John Mark Comer's old church, Tyler Stanton uh, took over for John Mark this past year. And uh, they did this thing early on in the pandemic where they went out to their people daily, uh, shepherding them daily with content. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and it was just great because they got into the daily rhythm of people, mm-hmm. other people's lives mm-hmm. instead mm-hmm. of just kind of sporadic rhythms, which is kind of mm-hmm. what we tend to do. Um, mm-hmm. They really, it's like starting with, okay, where are our people at? And they created daily rhythms of content. And then the third one, it's not a church, but Dave Adamson's Instagram. I'm <laughs> telling you that uh, you guys got to follow. Dude. Dave and Heather both are amazing at like being intentional about discipling people online, not just posting content. Dave, I just got to call you out in a good way. Like what you're doing to bring those, those words, the words of God in, in a way that's like, you know, where you're facilitating conversation, asking mm-hmm. questions online, not just posting content. Mm-hmm. Um, and Heather, what you do to like actually talk to people and have conversations in a way that I feel like you're having a conversation with me. Those are the types of things too. We can learn from churches who are doing it right. We can learn from leaders who are doing it right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and we just like, and I'm not, Dave and Heather aren't paying me for this. I'm just saying like, they are amazing at that. So I learned from them and then I'm able to like, be able to take those lessons and apply them to the institution that I serve as well. Okay. Thanks dude. Yeah. I just say one thing I'm hearing is ease of access, right? If we can make it easy for people to connect and give access that that's an opportunity technology gives us. And I know there's a church here in Seattle, Washington called reach church who does guided prayers on their mobile app. And man, that has been a tool that I've just been so encouraged by as a busy mama of a two and a half year old, just being able to set a guided prayer as I'm getting ready for the day is such a gift and that it's a church in my community that I know and I'm familiar with. So that's just another example that came to mind for myself uh, that I use and, and have really enjoyed. So man, thank you guys so much for so many great uh, thoughts and questions and conversation. Um, I know I'm leaving just encouraged and uh, more envisioned for the work that we all get to do in caring for the, the gospel and the kingdom. So again, thank you. Just those quick reminders. Here are those links. If, if anyone had questions, I know we've been putting them in then. Yes. Thank you, Dave, for waking up so early. Heather, thank you so much for being here. Man, I love both of your passions for online, for reaching the next generation. Just thank you for the work you do. Joe, thank you. And to the rest of the team at Barna. That I love that we can have stats, we can have like logical thought behind the work that we're doing as well. I, I just, I know our God is God of faith, but he's a God of logic and reason too. And so I just appreciate what you guys are doing. And Nick, man, you're never allowed to leave the Subsplash team. We, we love having you. <laughs> and we're going to get everyone else here sooner than later. I'm kidding. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, we appreciate you all so much. Have a blessed day and happy Easter. Mm-hmm.